Now the next piece of the workbook is on analysis, and we're going to start doing some analysis, but we really want to use the analysis to get to our applications. Are, are we rolling now? So this chapter talks about what do I do when I get called and somebody says they've got a problem. So as a tuner, I'm putting a whole bunch of information together. I've got to have my hardware inventory. I've got to have my software inventory. I've got to have some sort of interview with the person that's giving me complaints. And in that customer complaint, I've got to ask them subjectively what it is. Common ones being batch, uh, elapse time, or interactive response time. And you were very right yesterday when you said they call and they say system slow. What you've got to do is get past system slow to say, well, what does that mean objectively? What can I measure? Okay, so we're trying to get objective, the subjective to objective measurements. And when I'm going to objective measurements, the first set of metrics I prefer to talk about is health of the system. How healthy is the system? And that is SAR and PCP. In particular, SAR-U will give me a very quick view of how healthy my system is. So I could have a slow phone line logged in across the Pacific to a Singapore and still run SAR, one space 15, get a quick view of how healthy my system is. The second set of metrics that I'm then trying to get objectively is quality of service. How do they know if they're getting work done? Quality of service metrics are usually like an accounting data. So ACCOM, for example, ACCVT, or CSACOM, are the kinds of commands that give me my quality of service metrics. In other words, how long did it take to get my service? How long did it take to get my solution done? So out of these two, you're asking the customer then also the server type. So they say it's a web server, it's a database server, it's an Oracle engine, it's a batch compute server for car crashes. You gotta figure out what did they buy the computer for? What's the applications? And for example, in database markets, you want to know if it's online transaction processing, OLTP, credit card transactions, which is typically lots of little I.O., or if it's uh, media assets, like database, DBMS, such as video assets. So I could have Oracle that's saving uh, credit card transactions, or I have Oracle saving where video movies are being kept, or my hotel room in room movies. Okay. So I'm trying to, from this information, characterize what's the customer running. And from that, figure out, am I reading more than writing, writing more than reading? Do I expect to be CPU bound, memory bound, IO bound? Those sorts of questions. So if I know I'm looking at an NFS server, I know I've got home directories and I've got IO situations. Okay. If I'm looking at a web server, then I look at the web types of specifics. I'm taking hardware, the software, the customer interview, and then I've got to get from that actual SAR data and actual accounting data. My third set of uh, objective metrics then would be my interrogation. And not run these in normal production environment because they, they're expensive. But for example, PAR. I would not run PAR all the time, but if I have an I.O. problem, I would then look at the problem with particular sets of tools. So interrogation now is saying, okay, I see the problem, here's my application running, let's look specifically at what's going on with that application. So interrogation in this case would be tools like SS Run, Perfex, PAR, there are others, but those are the key ones that we care about for the day. Okay. 
And I also have to take into consideration uh, ESP and syslog type of data. If I've got performance problems, they may show up in the ESP or syslog. If the RAID cabin has a spindle go down, I may have error messages showing up in syslog. I don't, I don't need to go any further. Okay. Maybe we'll find a few other things that we're going to put into this puzzle. So the other piece that you're missing was the uh, profile in interrogation. So I've got to put all this information together to decide what do I have and what do I want to do with what I've got. How does my configuration match the workload characteristics I get from my interrogation? Let's just go back up here. So usually when I get called, there's a performance problem. And that's what I've got to do is ask them, what is this problem like? I have to figure out subjectively what they're complaining about. And then I've got to figure out what do I want to measure. By the way, I also, besides server type, would then want to know about the metrics they watch. If they say it's car crashes per day or web hits per hour, that metric is something that I want to instrument and look at. Now, most sites try to monitor things proactively. So at the end of the week, it's not uncommon for these sites to have a, a court board outside the data center that posts the utilization charts and nowadays, everyone's posting it to web pages. So uh, you go to General Motors, and you can go to a web page, and there will be a month's utilization information of how busy CPU was, how busy memory was, and how busy the disk drives were for that prior month. And that's what SPV is kind of designed for, to help you be proactive about this, catch it ahead of time. The other thing I'm going to be asking myself, though, this is the hard part when I come into a problem, I don't know what's changed, I don't have perspective, I don't have my baseline. So if I had a BSYS test or ESP reports to tell me something's changed in the last week, then that might be something that I'd look at. In this one case where Oracle was doubled in size, that wasn't in the system log, that was in a log just for the Oracle application. So suddenly Oracle got twice as big, but I didn't have historical information to say, it wasn't twice as big before, I didn't have that perspective. Uh, you may have a, a log of user complaints. So they call the help desk and say performance was real bad or something like that. And again, in that log, you may be asking them subjectively what are they complaining about. Performance means different things to different people. Mostly, though, it has my interactive response time increased. When people say my system is slow, that usually means that interactively they're getting very poor response. And that's what I mean by subjectively, are we talking bash or are we talking interactive? Now the interactive is very dependent upon file system buffer cache. The bash it depends upon the application. So if I have the chance, I'd like to experience the system myself. Keep in mind, a computer can go through performance problems on every resource in the same day. So I may log in and experience a problem that's a swapping problem. 15 minutes later, it might be an I.O. problem. So when the users are complaining about their performance event, I'd like to be on the system live if I can. And then the nice thing to be able to do is to look at my timing, to look at my SAT data. And from that, then I've got to figure out my area of concentration. So from SAR, I'm able to say CPU memory I.O., what's kicking up the most. And then from accounting, I can figure out name of the programs, name of the users, and then I can sort my priorities. If interactive response is important, buff view and uh, file system buffer cache might be important. And that's the hard part most people have is figuring out where do I go from here. And to me, looking at SAR data tells me what are the potential problems. So if I see high CPU utilization, I know that CPU wait time is going to be there. If I see disk drives busy, I look for I.O. wait times. So the SAR-U gives me an idea of what to look for and what to expect. But let me give you an example. I went to uh, Merck Pharmaceutical. Doing, uh, Charm was their main application for uh, you know, pharmaceutical uh, chemistry modeling, molecular modeling of the, uh, the drug that they're doing, drug designs. And I looked at, I had a month's worth of data at Merck Pharmaceutical. It was 99% utilized in CPUs for the whole month. Memory was 95% utilized for the whole month. 
but there was no swapping, and the run queue length was never more than the number of CPUs they were had on their system. So in other words, CPU and memory were not oversubscribed. They were running pretty clean. Then I looked at I.O. and saw I.O. was real bad. The I.O. cache hit rates were terrible on this machine. And you think, oh, SAR tells me i got a problem here. But then when I went to the accounting data, the problem wasn't in the bread and butter workload. So when I went to the accounting data, it was 10,000 seconds of user time, 10,000 seconds of CPU wait time, 50,000 seconds of NQSQ wait time, and less than 100 seconds of IO wait time. So my point being is that look, using just the SAR data, I saw a number that looked bad. I said, I better tune it and make that SAR number look better. But in fact, if I had done that, it would have been counterproductive to my main applications. Because when I looked at my accounting data, it spent all of its time waiting on CPUs. Now in this particular case, if I had increased cache, I might have started swapping. And the swapping would have been worse than the original problem. So what I'm trying to say is that the SAR data tells me what to look for, the health of the different resources, but I have to put that together with what's it costing me in the time domain. That's what I tried to say yesterday. Performance co-pilot is an oxymoron. There's no metric in there that tells me about performance. It tells me frequency domain, and from that, I go to the time domain, and I make an implied situation. And that works when there's only one thing running on the system. But if I've got 50 different users at a university site running 30 different programs, that no longer works. Because one is doing good and another one is doing bad. So the timing data, I'm going from frequency counters to time counters and looking at things in the time domain. So that's everything that I'm trying to do is saying, okay, if my utilization is high, what's it costing me in my time domain? If I'm taking 10 seconds for VI to come up, what's happening during those 10 seconds? Anyway, a couple other pieces. You can't perform analysis without measuring things. As a minimum, check config SAR on would be the minimum that I would want on the system. If I have accounting data there, I want to be able to get to it and use it. If there's no accounting data there, then I have to make some assumptions. I have to be careful about what I say because my conclusions are, are assumptions. Because I only know approximately what the accounting data might look like. And also, measuring will affect the measurement. When we start using PAR, PAR will show up in the PAR measurements. So the, the measuring itself will eventually show up. When I talked about Merck Pharmaceutical, they had Gaussian charm and something called squeal, and then number four was top. Things like that. Or screen savers. Things of that sort. So I've got to ask, what do I want to measure? And that's what I'm trying to figure out from this customer complaint. What is it that I can measure to identify what their performance complaint is? When you have for the SAR data, what exactly do you ask? I mean, what command? Because SAR has too many things. Right. Know? So when you say SAR, it's too broad for me. I mean, what I want for SAR? You know, We're going to go through SAR and use the metrics in the particular order that I said yesterday. So when I go through okay. SAR, I'm going to see you first memory second, uh, disk third, and buffer cache fourth. And the SAR minus U is going to give me all that. So that's going to be a U and a Q. This one was the little R and the big R. This one was the D and this one was the B. Okay. Just to be generic. Now with SPV, it's designed to do them in the order that I'd come in. I don't believe in looking at just one metric and going from there. So I start off with SAR dash U. And on the U, then I've got user, I've got system, I've got what's called S break, and I've got IO weight, and the IO is actually broken into file system, swap, uh, physical IO to disk, and also then the uh, graphics. So whichever one is biggest, did you have a question or comment? WFIF. <laughs> what's FIF? FIFOs? Yeah, the pipe, the data oh, pipe, pipe to pipe. the graphics head. So one is context switching as the graphics head can't do anything because the hardware can't keep up to the data stream. And the other one is the actual data stream, the pipe itself. So sometimes I tune my systems and eventually those are the only ones sticking up. 
and that's upgrading your graphics card or getting more pipes to the graphics card, those sorts of things. So when I look at this data then, this is going to tell me that I want to go to uh, things like Perfex and SSRI. This one's going to tell me that I want to look at PAR. This one tells me I want to look at Malix. S-break usually means memory growth. My program's trying to grow. The S-break one says I'm waiting on a Malik. And there are some SS run experiments to look at that, but I would also be interested in SAR-W. And then for I.O., I've got a whole bunch of things, but really R again. Tell me about the I.O. characteristics going on. Also the buff view. And uh, SAR-D was in front of this one. There are a couple others in the system one that we'll look at later. When you do the PAR command, I thought that PAR command is to do a PAR on the own application. You know, the only way I have used PAR, I have never used PAR in any it's, way. It's tracking a couple of things in the kernel, but it can do it on a per application basis. So in this case, when you do PAR, would be... We're going to do it on the whole system. Oh, okay. Not just on an individual program. Okay. Now my system time is time doing system calls. Applications are making the system calls. So when I run R, I'm looking at the system calls that the applications are making. Right, exactly. So I'll try to get to a case study a little bit later where the site called in and said I got 80% system time. So I then ran PAR on it and it showed the semaphore operations were failing. So it was thrashing on semaphore operations. And it was Oracle that was making these calls. And the system call to get a semaphore was failing. So it just keep trying again and again and again. And I asked them, first of all, check with IPCS. Are there any unattached semaphores? If they are, remove them. Otherwise, up with system the number of semaphores you need on your system. You had to measure that with IPCS in the first place. So PAR was telling you what program was causing the high system time and also the name of the system call that was causing the high system time. So this is the example of a SEM operations. There's another site that might be reads or writes or other types of system calls. And we're gonna see some of those as I start driving up system time probably first thing tomorrow morning. We'll start bringing our system time up more. Okay. Now, so based upon SAR-U, that tells me what to look for. But then it's things like the accounting data that tells me, does it matter to me? So I can see high weight FS, for example. This might be real high. But then I go to my accounting data and see the application that has it is send mail, and I don't care about send mail. Or another possibility is asynchronous I.O. There could be applications like in an NFS environment where I have multiple I.O. requests stacked up. So in that situation, weight FS would always be high. So every situation, every site is different. Two different sites, both running Oracle, will look different. Okay. So I got to figure out, this is going back to the customer complaint, getting from subjective to objective. So there are different types of metrics. And the first one that the user cares about, that's the ultimate one, elapsed time. Time to solution. How long did it take to get my work done? Okay. If I'm trying to find the next prime number, I don't want to wait 10 years for it. Now, user satisfaction ultimately is elapsed time, but part of my elapsed time is going to be system load issues, and some of it is my program's fault. So there's a ratio, a metric called expansion factor. Remember the expansion factor yesterday we went through it was elapse over service time. Okay. So if my service time stays the same, if I run the program, it takes an hour. And then I run the program again, it takes 10 hours. And nine hours of that was waiting on CPUs, and one hour it was doing the work. In that case, the 10 hour job that should have taken an hour was 10 times longer than normal. So that'd be an expansion factor of 10. So if we had one hour of service and it took 10 hours to get it through the system, that'd be an expansion factor of 10. 
the higher the expansion factor, the worse the quality of service. Now, most sites want their expansion factors less than five. But if it's a one-month job, now it's taking five months. And that seems unacceptable, too. Whereas if I got a one-second process that now takes five seconds, well, that's completely tolerable. Big difference, right? So this expansion factor, for example, you go to General Motors, they'll generate expansion factors for all their work during the last month. And then they actually have a contract with the user community providing quality of service uh, specifications. And they tell their user community, if I cannot give you a quality of service, an expansion factor less than five, I will give you a price break. Things like that. So there's actual contracts, what's called a service level agreement that says, if I can't achieve the quality of service, well, what's the consequence? So those are the kinds of metrics that the user cares about. So that, that, uh, that time can only be, uh, that information can only be taken from stuff like accounting, right? Yeah, yeah. You go from SAR, that's general, no. that includes everything. That's correct. Okay. Now you do get some of that information in top. There's the WCPU, the weight CPU over on the right and stuff. So that top is giving you what percentage of the interval I looked at was I hogging the system. So it's, it's the opposite of an expansion factor. It's called a hog factor, which is service over elapse type of thing. And in that case, with top, the elapse is every second. During that last second, what percentage of the time was it connected to a CPU or what percentage was it waiting on a CPU? So top, again, it is per process, and that's what you were saying. Whereas SAR does not tell me any per process information. But I can assume if SAR shows us resource high that there was going to be uh, effects. CPU weight, memory weight, IO weight, disk weight, those sorts of things. So that's, a, that's the way the user looks at the system. Now the data center manager, they're more interested in productivity. What's my throughput? How many car crashes can I get done in a day? They don't care how long it takes them, they care about how many. And another metric then is the capacity. So if I go to a system and look at a month's worth of accounting data, I want a month's worth of CPU time accounted for. Okay. Some of these sites will actually draw charts, we'll see a little bit later, where they look at CPU hours on a month-by-month -month basis and can see what my utilization was like. So they want to say, if I've got uh, a certain capacity, am I using it all because I need to charge for it so that I can buy the next system, so that I can maintain my system and upgrade it, things like that. Now, as a system tuner, the ones we care about were utilization and run levels. Remember, that's what I said yesterday. When I go to my metrics, the first one I care about is busy and run levels. That's what I've got up here still. So in my busy and utilization, every time I look, is something using it. And how many things are using it. So I could be 100% utilized at Merck. I was 100% utilized, 99 but there are only three things using it on a core CPU system. So I could have one thing using the whole system or I could have a hundred things using the whole system. And those are completely different stories. And then the other metrics are the ones that I was just talking about that the user cares about, which was my elapsed time and wall clock factors. So utilization and run levels, what I was talking about here. How busy is it and what is the queue length? Which command do you use for the SAR-Q was one of them. Okay. With disk, there's a SAR-D gives Q lengths. Okay. And Q also gives me my IO Q lengths. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll see some of that. Now this intensity is really the batch interface. Uh, Q lengths here refers to batch Q lengths. How many things are in a queue waiting to run? And by the way, for those people from out of town or in town, we're going through an interesting experiment for the next six weeks in Minnesota, in, in St. Paul, Minneapolis. We've shut off all the ramp meter lights. I've always used that as an analogy for NQS. Before you get onto the freeway here, you have to go through this ramp meter that's designed to spread out your traffic. So the legislator said, I don't know if these things work. So they're doing a six week experiment shutting them off and then they're actually paying certain people to drive through the traffic areas and, and measure how long it takes to get from point A to point B. You know, 
know, now if I had information on every car so that every car could give me telemetry information, then I could build a better model and decide whether this experiment's going to help or not. But yesterday was the first day of it. So the news has been covering uh, the traffic jams. And uh, I had uh, one person that tried to get to North Minneapolis yesterday, took an extra hour. But that was because everyone was avoiding the freeways and going on the side streets from what I hear. So the traffic patterns changed because of it. Yes. Other people are getting better. Some are getting better and some are getting worse. And isn't Minneapolis the only state in the United, or only city in the United States that has this metering? Uh, we are the first ones to actually do it to my knowledge. There are other cities that do it in critical spots. You don't need it in every intersection or anything. But it's a way of throttling back during rush hour so that everybody doesn't get on the freeway and then it gets into a gridlock. Okay. But for me, the batch interface, that's what I'm talking about here. The queue length is the car stuck behind the ramp meters. Okay, and, there, and everyone that I saw on the news yesterday said, guess what? I'm not in line behind the ramp meter anymore. The beginning of the line is just further down the ramp than where the meter was. So they're still queuing up to get onto the freeway. It's just that they're still having trouble merging in and out. And now the line, instead of stopping at the meter, is stopping at the entry onto the freeway. So some people are saying it's worse because now the merging, that pressure of getting on and off in the uh, merge area under the bridges is where a lot of the uh, bottleneck is occurring right now. So they're, instead of waiting behind the light, they're still waiting, but they're waiting further down the line. They're able to fill up that blank space between the ramp meter and the entry onto the freeway. But we'll see in six weeks how it goes. So uh, Q length is saying, if I were to, to do this experiment, I would have wanted the number of cars that are stuck behind all these meter lights to measure and predict what's going to happen. And I don't have that sort of information in their experiment. As well as the arrival rate, what's the intensity of cars? You know, if we have a sports event, there's going to be a high intensity of cars going on the freeway, and that's what the reader ramps, um, ramp meters are designed for. Not three in the morning when nobody's on the road. And I'm going to use a lot of road analogies, but how many people have been to Mountain View and been down uh, 101, for example? The more lanes you have, the more potential abuse there is. I can drive down the freeway at 3 in the morning and not have any bottlenecks because there's no cars there. But when I try to do it at 4 o'clock, I've got a severe problem because now everybody's on it. The more lanes you have, the more potential you have for cars trying to change lanes. And that's one of the problems going into Mountain View with the traffic trying to out. It's trying to cross the traffic going in to get into Shoreline Drive. That's context switching. As I'm changing cars from lane to lane, the analogy would be a context switch is occurring. Okay, and they actually have meters going on to 101 for some of the ramps, but they don't use them, they're turned off. And instead, everyone queues up down trying to do the merge. So it's one place or the other. But it's when the arrival rate at 4 o'clock in the afternoon is bad, not at 3 in the morning when nobody's there. So anyways, just going back to what I was doing, I took the origin as a black box. I just dropped it in and said, I'm going to submit the work at it. I had these four programs I've been running on other systems. By the way, I used these same four programs in my Linux Beowulf cluster class. We're using PBS instead of NQE, but it's the same codes. And they are slower on the Linux cluster, even though the clocks are faster. So I just throw the workload at the system, and I'm measuring the response time with accounting. And then a part of the accounting is giving me service time and some wait times. And that's why I was concerned earlier today, because the IO wait times are, are changed in the way they're being used. They've changed the code, but they haven't changed the lock uh, counting. So it used to be a buff lock and a BIO lock. Buff lock was for buffer cache, and BIO was for disk. But now I'm starting to see stuff differently. So uh, the numbers are changing on me as I speak. So just to summarize, SAR is what I use for behavior of the system. Okay, I can be on a system with good behavior, or a good SAR data and bad performance. I've been on systems that SAR looked fine, and it was 10 minute waits for a man page. Okay, and I've been on other systems where SAR data, system time was 90%, but interactive response was fine. Okay, so there's always something on the side. When you're looking at something, you're missing everything else. 
So SAR can imply performance problems, but again, it doesn't time things. It doesn't show the effect of resource managers or schedulers. So one thing could be doing good and one thing could be doing bad. A very good example of that is single-threaded and multi-threaded applications. We're going to talk about this on Thursday, but in the interactive timeshare band in IRIX, multi-threaded applications are penalized. The developer said, I do not want multi-threaded gangs to gang up on my interactive user. So they've got what they call a currency scheduler. The currency scheduler in IRIX is distributing my CPUs by process group. So when I fire off an OpenMP application, it starts its own process group and is treated as a single scheduling entity. So me with one process interactive gets just as much CPU time as another OpenMP process that may be 30 threads wide. That's still treated as a single program. And that means the multi-threaded application is going to fail. It's not going to be able to talk to each other because it's always scheduled, waiting for a CPU, never getting any work done. And the interactive user is getting good and the batch work is getting bad. We're going to see that because when we get into multi-threading code 2, things are going to get worse until we lock things down in real time or things of that sort. So I feel too many people read too much out of SAR or PCP type of data. It simply tells you what can I expect, what can I look for. It's a behavioral tool. I like to compare it to the inkblot test that a psychologist is going to give you. So as a SAR, my first hat that I put on as a system tuner is to figure out behavior of the system. And that's what we were talking about up here. I had six resources. I'm talking about four of them here. Here's my CPU ones. Here's my memory one. Here's my file system and memory as well. This one would be two, this one would be three, and this one would be three. So I've got CPU memory, I've got disk, actually this one would be four as well. What the S break does? SBRK. S-break is the system call that Malik makes for a program to grow. Mm. So I start off at a certain size and I say, oh, I'm going to have a one gig array here. So I make a library call that results in Malik asking for that memory. So it only reflects the reservation. Correct. It only reflects the reservation. So when I make a Malik, the Malik is the library name that C and Unix has. And then Malik calls S break or whatever it might be on that Unix flavor for the kernel to actually accomplish it. Okay. So S break is a Malik or a memory growth, but that's what the kernel called it. So Malik makes a system call named S break. So, anyways, my first hat is just as a psychologist looking for behavior. Then my second hat is going to the accounting data as an accountant saying, what do my timings look like? So to me, if I've got accounting data there, it's going to tell me, particularly the batch market that we're talking about here, that's going to tell me how long these things are taking to run. And the extended accounting data in CSA has additional timings, and those are the timings that are bothering me today because they're timing out money. I do have to warn you, uh, I've got to leave early today for a meeting. Uh, I'll probably be leaving about 3.30 this afternoon. So I'll leave you with some work to do, and uh, Janet might be around to answer questions if she wants to try to, but uh, I'll give you some projects basically to do between 3.30 and 5. So I was going to give her a minute to get back, but I may as well just cover it. So my first piece really is getting SAR on. I said before, I need to have an, a data to analyze the situation. Uh, I'd hate to tune a car if I had no, nowadays you need a computer to tune a car, or timing lights, or things like that. I'd hate to actually have to tune something without the, the ability to measure the effect of what I'm tuning. So the first thing then is check config SAR on. That is my minimum. So I get somebody that calls me with an O2, and they've got performance problems, I'm going to do a check config SAR on. That is the lightest thing to do. PCP costs money, and PCP does have more load to it. But PCP also has more metrics it can get to. It can look at a lot more things. The second thing is the cron tab for SAR. It's actually in the sys cron tab. It's running not as root, but typically as sys. 
And there are two scripts in user lib sa that are running from cron. So this is when I do the check config sar on, it says if check config, then run that script. So the default is to run it every 20 minutes on prime and every hour on non-prime. In this case, I've set it to run every 10 minutes all the time. And having looked at SAR data for 15 years, 10 minutes is just the right interval for a day, a week, or a month. Now on do, I'm doing it every minute because we're in a test situation. And some of my programs are only a minute long. So that's the only reason that I've gone to a one minute sample to have something tighter to look at. With PCP, I could go into one second samples. But that'd be so much data, I wouldn't be able to handle the data. So I find 10 minute samples to be the best. So when I talk to sites, they're usually 20 minute samples during prime and one hour during non-prime. But if it's a batch compute server, it probably has jobs running over the weekend and those would normally come out at one hour intervals, and I want to get them back to 10 minute intervals. Okay. The default sampling is one hour? This one is every 10 minutes. Is the default? The default was every 20 minutes for prime and every hour for non prime. If you look at you your. change it to every 10 minutes, you think that that's the best? Every 10 minute prime time? If, if it's an expensive machine, if it's an O2 workstation, I'll leave it alone. But the more common uh, high end systems that are running batch work and stuff, 10 minutes works better. Oh, okay. well, let me see what I've got on my machine here. And the effect of the So there was, there's the default. What do you mean? I, I believe prime time is when the, the system is more busy, right? It's busier. I'll show you prime and non-prime, but this is the way they're doing it. So they're saying every hour, every day, zero through six. But then during the prime time, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., they're doing 20 minute samples Monday to Friday and skipping Saturday and Sunday. So they, this was the default. And I got rid of both lines and then added a line that said every 10 minutes all the time. So the workbook is what I would switch those two lines to. But again, if it's an O2, I'm not going to go that far. If it's NASA trying to uh, simulate airflow over a shuttlecraft, I will go that far. It depends upon the type of work and the type of system that they're doing. And then where is the data located? Okay, that's where we're going. Okay. So all the data is in VAR ADMSA. Now one other thing though, this one generates an ASCII report at the end of the day. So I get a binary and I get an ASCII report. Also, if it's an important site, by default they're getting rid of everything that's older than seven days. And I like to have the whole month. So I usually have them comment out this fine and not scrub old files. When I go to some of these sites, they have a year's worth of these data. They actually save the data off with the date and everything and can look at a whole a year or even five years worth of this data. Now the data is going to all go. Here's our process. All the tools are getting the data from the same place. Whether you're talking OSView, GrossView, Performance Copilot, or SAR, they're all the same counters. How many people have seen that LCD display bouncing on the front of the box? That's getting it from a program called MMSCD. And that is also making the same system call called SysMP. And then the argument is passing is SA get saying, give me the system activity data. So all the tools are making the same call. They're just different ways of looking at the data. I've just been using the generic term SAR to describe this data. Okay, but PCP, OSView, GrossView all go into the same counters. Now for SAR, this is what Warren was asking about. When I boot the system, the init.dscript is going to run SA1. And that's going to put a boot stamp in my file. So in this example, let's just see if I've got anything on. It's not open. I do not have check config SAR on right now. If I do a check config, prep for SAR, it's turned off, and that file does not exist. 
I can still go live though and see the live system. So going back to this handout here, the cron event was not occurring, so I did not have the bar 80 MSA file, and when it ran SAR, it said the file did not exist. Then I went SAR, the first number was time between samples, and the second number was the number of times I'm going to sample. Most people like a one space 120 for two minutes, but I, I stick to 15, 20 minutes, or a seconds, I mean. So when I went live, again, it's executing this SATC command that's making the system call and then printing it out to your console. If I do it off of the historical, I'm going to get the same sort of ASCII report, but it's coming from a different location. So let me go to uh, do again. And I type in SAR, and I've configured SAR on this machine to have one minute samples. So here's what that startup script is. Again, no reboot was required, but running that in a D script wrote that record in there. Okay, let me do it right now. So if I look at the end, there's nothing there. The SU, it's the init D, SA, SAR, start, that's what is it? the date. So the actual file is going to be SA and then the date. So if I look at today, I do a date. Today's the 17th. Okay. So in var ADM SA, I've got the 15th, 16th, and 17th in here. So when I invoke SAR by default, it's going into today's file. But if I want to look at uh, Sunday's file, for example, I can do a SAR-F. R ADM SA SA 15 and I'll page it here. And now I'm looking at the 15th rather than today's data. So the cron event is putting all that data into this SA date file, and then the SAR command can go to any one of those files. So that dash F would point to something other than the current date. And also at the end of the day then, SA2 is running to convert that binary file into an ASCII report. So in my prior example... Can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Why I cannot see those? I mean, is I going to use only SA, all I see is SA, SA1 and SA2. That's on your workstation? No, it's in you. Oh, those are the scripts. Right, and where is the historical data? The data is in VAR ADM. Oh, it's in variety. Okay, that's required. So those were the actual scripts running from the Quran event. Okay. Oh, okay. And then the actual, uh, one more, SA. SA? Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. So okay. the user lib SA was where the script event was coming from. Okay. And the actual SAR data was going in var ADM SA. Oh, okay. okay. Right. I do have an option on SAR to say put it into its own file as well. But user lib was where the actual script was coming from. And in fact, if I go off to that slash user slash lib, the SA2 script was the one that did, uh, let's see, that did the find at the end of it. And right now in my system, that find is still active at seven days, and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to VI SA2 and just turn off that particular line. Because I want to save more than a, a week's worth of data. So that was where the executables were. The other one was SA1. And that's the one that actually uh, runs SADC. So right here is when it runs the data collector. And it's dumping it all into bar ADM SA, SA dollar date. Okay. And then the third one is the executable. SADC is the actual executable that makes the system call. And SAR 
is the report generator, but SADC is the collector itself. So SADC can either write a binary file from Cron, or SAR will call SADC live to get the data. So that's the binary interface to actually make a system call. Whereas these other tools make their own system call, they don't do it through SADC, that's just for SAR. Now on my system, SPV, once that check config SAR on is on, SPV can then look at this data off the columns and plot them. So it makes it easier to visualize the data. That's one reason people don't like SP, uh, SAR is because it's not a GUI. This is taking a little bit, I'm not sure why. Nothing going on there. So I, SPV itself is having a problem, and I know why. So I'm not running its root. It's putting a scratch file out there in slash temp, but it's giving it root permission. So now I'll try it. Okay. I should make a note of that. There we are. So now if I take a look at this. This is running the SAR command and then visualizing it. So today's the 17th. I'm going to look at the 16th. So I popped up SPV and said, the SAR file I want to look at is bar ADMSA SA16. And I'll just hide that. So I'm going to look at yesterday's data. And again, these are ordered CPU first, memory second, IO third, and miscellaneous stuff at the end. So this is SAR-U, and here's yesterday's data now from about noon until the system was taken down about 16. These are days and then fraction of a day, so 0.5 would be uh, halfway through the day. So looking at yesterday, I had a lot of blue events. The blue events are my wait I.O. The red is my system time, and then the green is my user utilization. So somewhere here in the middle afternoon, we had two examples where programs ran but they were not driving my utilization up to 100%. However, I did have events where I was getting I.O. We're doing this right now. We're looking at this. So the health of my system is showing CPUs are healthy, but I.O. is not very good here because I've got I.O. events showing up here. It would be hard for me to sell this user more CPUs if this was an everyday typical situation. Now that, this is still SAR-U, so user time isn't bad yet. I await time is, and remember that end buff? I set it real small on purpose. 300, 400, 500, real small. That's why we're getting these blues. Here's my system time. Now again, what's a good number or bad number depends upon your system. So typically here, I'm between one or 2% system time. No outliers. But what I'm doing is holding my left mouse button down and then I can enlarge a certain area of the data. So system time is low right now. It's going to go up when we start tomorrow morning with multi-threading. Waste of time shows idle and wait I.O. There's interrupt handlers and S-breaks, and there was a little bit of S-break, it looks like, in here. And we did have a performance event yesterday where memory growth and mallets were occurring. Remember when I had a pause yesterday? You, I think, even brought it up at the time. And that looked like about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So there was some S-break events occurring, but the rest of it, there was no real interrupt handler events. If I were on a web server, interrupt handlers would be probably very high. And lastly, now I'm looking at the I.O. events. And blue is most of the time, which is waiting on my file system buffer cache. Red is my swap, so there was a little bit of swapping there and some swap activity going on here, too. A little bit of swap and also some physical I.O., but most of it is blue. So looking at this data right now, yesterday so far, we've been I.O. bound and a little bit of memory bound because of swapping. But I.O. bound consistently and memory bound during the heavy workload times. And that's when things were actually being killed yesterday. 
Now, I can also look at the same data from PCP. Let's see what we get here. Because this will show a couple of days, 15th, 16th, and 17th. And I've got reboots. The machine was rebooted last night, so I don't have data from last night until the reboot this morning. So let me go back to the setup and change my PCP file to be the uh, 16th to look at just yesterday's data. So we should see the same numbers. It doesn't look like it's quite the same. And the reason why is PCP died yesterday. The load got so bad, PCP timed out. And that's something that I gotta remember to do is to get the cron event to check to make sure PCP is running. If I load the system down hard enough, PCP will say, I can't get anything done, and it will actually terminate itself. So I don't have as much data in PCP as I did with uh, SAR. The SAR was a cron event, not a demon that's up and running all the time. System time was still real low. Again, we don't have the same interval we were looking at yesterday, but it's still less than 2%. And the weight I.O., we, we don't see as blue as much as we saw yesterday, and again, the timing stopped right there. So when we started swapping is when we got the timeout and then the, the uh, demon went down. Now my next step in the analysis, we're going to talk about this after lunch, but that would be then going to accounting data. So from this, I'm now able to look at my programs. So here is the data that I've got so far. I've got 17,000 CPU minutes accounted for this month so far in my accounting data. And of that, code 203, code 2 MP, and code 2, three quarters of my CPU usage on the system. If I were tuning the system, remember that CPU utilization was high, these would be the programs I'd want to check with. And they're also politically correct. Talking to the customer, I told you that the application should be code 2. That's my bread and butter. So I now know that code 2 is what the system's being used for, and that would be the application I'd be interested in profiling and knowing more about. That was CPU. Let's see what memory shows me. Well, you still got code 203, code 2 MP, but look at now we've got code 4 and something called ft.v.8, and there's a couple other code 4 flavors in here too. So code 4s are now starting to show up in my memory. They're big in memory, but not big in CPU. So I'm picking the top programs and figuring out what do they use. I'm going to skip elapsed time. For I.O., code 3 was half the I.O. on the system. Okay, then I've got uh, trivial TCP and also FSR underscore XFS, my file system defragmenter, looks like about a third of the I.O. on the system. And there is another code in there. Let's see, code 1 also did some I.O. So i got code 1, but most of it's code 3. So if I got an I.O. bound situation, that would be the code I'm interested in. And for uh, total number of records then, SADC and SAR are running every minute, so I'm getting a ton of those. The other ones are link, date, EXPR, RM, perfect, and then all my real applications. So most of my accounting data is SAR and SADC records from chronic events occurring every minute. And this is where I find uh, recursive scripts that may be run by the operators that are just plugging the system with uh, lots of little processes, like uname. Uh, one side I found half the processes were uname on the system, as they did it 10 times a second. So they had a recursive script that was calling uname 10 times a second. Now taking this further, so I looked at the health of the system. I looked at CPU, by the way. I did not look at memory or I.O. And I looked at PCP to see the same thing. And I looked at top programs. Now I'm going to go for top users. And I expect it to be root and sys and ADM. Because that's where a lot of that stuff was run. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go a little bit further now. I'm going to go into the accounting data. We haven't run anything today. That's probably not a good thing to do. But let's just see what we got here. We did run a few things here. So now, what we did yesterday with the raw commands, ASCII, 
I'm now doing with the plotting package. So these are my elapsed times, and I got colors here. So up here are my code twos. Down here are my code two oh threes. So I've got various. Here's my code threes. Here's my code fours. So it's taking that top command list that we were looking at with pie charts, and then pulling out the timing records for just those processes. So anything that was big, you CSA build the CSA commands did show up in the report, which is amusing. Okay. So I got code one, code two, code three, code four, my bread and butter plus accounting. And those accounting ones are blue or red, green. Those are way down in here. Here's one of my code twos. And here's all those CSA build ones. And then here's my code one starting right in here. Here's a code two that was small, it could have died. And then here's most of my code twos. They're ranging anywhere from 34 to 38 minutes for code two right now. And I said I want to get to 166 consistently. That's where I want to go. 166 seconds, and we're at 38 minutes. Now the accounting data doesn't give me wait times. Let me try another one here. CPU memory scatter plot now tells me my classes. So here's my big CPU, small memory. Here's my big memory, medium CPU. And here's my small CPU, small memory. So I now am starting to get classes. There's a class here program, so there's a class here, there's a class here, and there's a middle class. So I have one, two, three, four different classes of programs. One, two, three, four, plus interactive. We're not really seeing any interactive stuff in this. It's been filtered out. So we can't see what the interactive resource consumption is like. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. I'm just looking at the data we have on our system. Now, ActCVT goes one step further. So I'm going to try elapsed time first. Oops, yeah, it went one step further, all right. <laughs> and that's the problem I had with it yesterday. Yeah. This is a newer version, so I'm going to have to check on that. So how I actually do all this, if the person will have this, because this is something that most customers won't have, yeah. right? You, so this tool really helps it easier to get to the raw SAR, but you still have basic SAR. Now, I do have customers that run SPV or PCP. I, I know what you're saying. In some cases, I'll send them the script, and then they send me back the data that they've got. So I got a call a week ago about an Oracle machine just for fun here, on new, it was called site underscore new. Next graph, dash. Uh, let me just take the CPU utilization chart here. Now this site problem here was that it was towards the beginning of the month and the uh, seven day file limit was causing a wrap. This is the console that doesn't get me the window back. So basically, they tarred up the SPV output and then sent it back to me. Eventually, it'd be nice if uh, ESP did all of this. So this is seven days worth of data from a site I got a week ago. Let me uh, get rid of the background. Next to graph. take our lunch break here in a minute. So we're going to spend time looking at a couple other systems and what their SAR data looks like. Now unfortunately this was taken on the uh, of the 5th or something like that. So this is October and this is the last week of last September. And then I don't have any data in between. So looking at the data, this green is my user time. It's fairly small here, but look at my system time. So at the end of last month, my system time was up in the 60 or 70 percent range. And then right here, it dropped back down, and my user utilization went down as well. But now during this month, I also have utilization going up and system time going up. So there are cases where my system time is going above 50 percent. I'm actually going to zoom down into the data 
Let me look at the end of last month first. Make it larger. So here's uh, September 26th, September 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th. So we've got one, two, three, four, five days there. Okay. So during those five days, my user utilization was between 10 and 20%. Now this happened to be an Oracle machine. So 10 to 20% here. But riding on top of all that was the system time, which was up in the 50 to 60% range, even getting up to 75% system time. But then somewhere around the 30th, it fell back down. Okay, so, go ahead. When you say system time, what that means? That the system is waiting for something? It's time in the kernel doing system calls. That's the red one? That's the red one. And then the blue one? So that's this one, par. Okay. The blue one is my I.O. riding on top of it. So this is what would normally be called a stack bar chart. I don't, I don't understand that. Legend you have, like yeah. user plus C plus... Yeah, that, that's describing this as a stack bar. So the user is the first thing. So whatever green is, is the actual thing that's being plotted. But this machine's 100% utilization capable. So all these things would add up to 100%. So user plus system is the red line. So the actual system time is the difference between the two. But I've added it on top of the user because eventually it adds up to 100%. So with MS Works or something, we call this a stack bar type of chart. It, it, if I were able to do it, I'd color the area between each. Okay, but that's why it's documented this way. The red line being plotted is user plus system added on top of it, and then weight IO is added on top of that. And when you add the three, they can come up to 100 percent. It's a closed system. It's a finite capacity. So that's why they're added on top of each other in this particular example. And, and then in that case, you find that when you add it up all those percentages, you're close to the 100%. So there are a couple of times here where 100% of the time there's something either running or waiting to run. And in, in particular, waiting on I.O. So at this particular point, I had processes using the CPU, but most of it was kernel system time doing system calls. And then there are processes waiting on I.O. during that event. In fact, when this, we can see where one event ended here and my wait I.O. time went back down. Then my system time went back down, but I still had wait I.O. riding on top of it. So here was an event for a couple hours here now where my uh, wait I.O. event was close to 80 or 90 percent. So I was I.O. bound during that time. I was system bound during this time. I was I.O. bound during this time. So how do you actually solve that issue if you're waiting too much for I.O.? Well, the first thing to solve here was the system time. So we have to go, well, tomorrow I'll take a look at the power command and take a look at that system time. Then the second thing would be to, to identify the wait I.O. time. Now if I look at just system time for this particular system, I guess I should look at uh, the beginning of this month too. So I got data on the 4th of October, that's when they sent it to me. They ran the, the SPB script on the 4th, tarred up the scratch directory, and then mailed it to me. So during this month, again, my user time has been real low, but there were bursts here where I had high user time. And then here's my blue, which is my weight I.O. events. And then here everything started going wrong. My system time went up and my weight I.O. time went up, and that's basically where things were when they snapshot the system. Now what I'm doing here is getting a baseline, I'm getting a reference. Okay, so when I'm looking at it live, I now have rules of thumbs. I know that typically my system time should be low, my user utilization should be under 20%. So I'm looking at the system live, I've got the perspective of saying, what is this machine typically like? If they say they've got a performance problem and I log in on the first, I'm not going to see their performance problem. If I logged in on the third, I would have seen the performance problem. Okay, so so when I log in, I don't know if the performance complaint correlates to what the machine is doing at the time I log in. But having this information gives me that reference, that perspective. Now, out of curiosity, after CPU, the next one was system time. Instead of adding it on top, this is just standalone.
and there we can see the system time was typically, there was a little bit of interrupt handler time too, but the system time is typically between 45 and 55 percent. At one point it looks like about 58 percent of the system time. Okay, so to look at that is par. So what did they do on the afternoon of the 29th? Uh, I'm not completely sure what was going on yet. It could have been that they re an application under Oracle released a whole bunch of semaphore operations and then there was room to breathe. So every time they run out of semaphores, they go into this thrash state where Oracle's sitting there saying, give me a semaphore, give me a semaphore, and they're all busy. So you get the system called denied and you try again until it's successful. I mean, they ran for four days, five days, yeah. and then it went back to work. Yeah. So something that was using those semaphores released it or I asked, also asked them to do IPCS and IPCRM to remove anything. Okay, so I could have removed unattached semaphores, or I could have upped the number of semaphores on the system. And I have not heard back from the site since uh, last week. But what I'm doing is getting my reference. So I would say normally my system time is under five percent. If I want to set a threshold now, I'd say if I go over ten percent, ping me, let me know what's going on, run par, and get some information. 